Pray again that the purpose of everything is, I really should start quizzing you on this, union with God through Christ and his mystical body, the church. And in this series of our preaching, we are focusing on one particular aspect of that union with Christ, and that is union in our wills. The union which is love, because love is just that, a union of wills, that is our wills with the will of God. When we speak of divine love and the theological virtue in which part, we participate in that, we call it charity. Charity is love for God and loving our neighbor for God's sake. We hear reference in the collect of today's Mass. This last part is missing from a lot of people because they say that, for example, they're not, they, we accept a lot of sin in other people because for some strange reason we think that if we don't agree with someone's sin and they don't like us for it, that we are not loving them. That is not correct. You cannot love someone by choosing something that's against the will of God, something that God does not want for them. One of the very common examples of that, you probably have this in your own families, is in attempted marriages, where someone is marrying someone that they are not free to marry, and you feel that you cannot stand on the line because they will be offended. But it is not loving because if to accept that sin because love is of God and that is not God's will. God's will is love. Again, all of his commandments, all of his counsels have to do with what love looks like. And sin is choosing to will what God does not will. What I'd like to do today is to look at the very different ways that we can sin, the distinctions among sin. The first one, of course, is that of the sin that we inherit and the sin that we participate in. The sin of Adam is called original sin. And as it's inherited by us in our very human nature, it is enmity of the human race with God because the head of the human race chose to separate us from God and his love. And of course, in Christ redeems us and reconciles us and we participate in that reconciliation when we are made part of Christ through baptism. This is, of course, inherited in our human nature unless God intervenes to stop it as he did with his blessed mother. The sin which we commit, however, and that's what we're going to focus on, is called actual sin. Original sin is taken care of in baptism. What we have to confess and repent of is our own actual sins. So what is actual sin? Well, let's first of all ask, what is a moral act? A moral act is a deliberate choice, and that choice is a sin when we choose against love as God has revealed it. Deliberate means that our intellects are involved in the choice, that our minds inform all of our actions. And a moral act is one that our wills freely consent to. So it's not a moral act, and therefore not right or wrong, if an act is not really chosen. Reflexes, for example, a true reflex is not sinful because a choice is not involved. Although blood circulation is not is never going to be a sin, it wouldn't be a sin even if, if it was, because we don't choose the autonomic systems of our body. The things that are don't involve a free choice cannot therefore be sinful nor meritorious. So again, in what follows, it's very important to remember what sin is. It's not breaking a rule, it's a deliberate choice against love. Now, the first distinction that we make as Catholics, and which in some ways is not actually an important distinction because you need to repent of all your sins, is that between the degrees of sin. Now, there are reasons why it's important to know the degrees, but ultimately, all of our sin crucifies our Lord and therefore is something which we ought to avoid and repent of. 
St. John explicitly refers to mortal sin in his first epistle. He says, if anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin, he will ask and God will give him life for those whose sin is not mortal. There is a sin which is mortal. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin which is not mortal. Clear, explicit, it's in the Bible. There is a such thing as mortal sin. But our Lord himself even distinguishes in degrees of sin and the fact that knowledge can mitigate that. He says in St. Luke's Gospel, And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not make ready or act according to his will, shall receive a severe beating. But he who did not know and did not and did what deserved a beating shall receive a light beating. You might also want to note that it doesn't matter how much you know, if you are doing wrong, it is deserving of a beating. So when a sinful choice is made without full knowledge or consent or involves things of lesser gravity, we call those venial. The heart has not given itself to evil in a definitive way. A lack of freedom, for example, from fear or addiction would make a sin venial even if it is in a serious area. But sins which are serious and which are chosen deliberately and freely our choices against love such that they cut us off from love himself. One of the typical ways that's been said is that it kills the life of God in you. But really what that is, is it is you definitively choosing to separate yourself from love, capital L. And that is why it is mortal, because it kills the life of grace in our souls. God being, of course, the source of that grace. Now, because of what sin is, what a moral act is, deliberate choices, there are a lot of ways that we can sin because we make choices constantly. Every choice, deliberate choice that we make is a moral act. You say so yourselves in the confitior of the Mass. What is it you pray? You confess your guilt in your thoughts and in your words and what you have done and what you have failed to do. Even though our thoughts are not manifest to other people, thank God, they are still sinful if deliberately chosen. But if they come from outside or if we do not choose to entertain them, they are not sinful. I have to make that distinction in confession all the time. Did you have the thought or did you entertain the thought? Because there's a big difference. Our words and physical actions can be sinful, of course. We have to be particularly mindful of the damage that words can do. This whole nonsense of sticks and stones can break my bones, but words cannot hurt me is absolute garbage. And I have to deal with people constantly, especially our young people, who suffer from the words that are spoken to them. But note that we also confess our omissions, because an omission is a deliberate choice to not act. And the choice is therefore sinful or not. So even though you are not technically doing something, you are doing something because you are making the choice. But because of what these choices are, we can also participate in the sins of other people. Anytime that we choose another person's sin, then we are choosing to sin ourselves. In the book, This is the Faith, which I believe I've recommended before, and there should still be copies in the gift shop. Remember, we're not making a profit on this, but you should have a copy. We can participate in these sins by counsel, that is advising, by command, if we're in charge, by concealment, by consent, by defense of the evil done, by partaking in it ourselves, by provoking it, by praise or flattery of the evil done, or by silence, by not saying something when we ought to. Again, we can choose to cooperate with other people's sins that way. There is a distinction of degrees of cooperation in the sins of others, which we're not going to speak about at this moment, which are important in the morality of, for example, politics and economics. But if we take this idea of deliberate 
choice as being the matter for sin or not, then it goes even further than simply participating in the sins of others. Avoiding the near occasion of sin, something which when we make our nightly act of contrition we say we're going to avoid, is a matter of moral choice as well. Because when you know that you're going to overeat if you go into a buffet and you walk into the buffet, even before you take a bite, you have chosen the sin. Now, I'm using food as an example, but it applies to many, many, many other people, places, or objects. This deliberate choice of entering an irritation of sin is also a matter of moral matter. But there's also a moral matter of forgiveness. And this is actually at the root of so much of our spiritual ills, is a lack of forgiveness, because we're talking again about the state of the heart, which is made by our choices. When we do not forgive, when we deliberately choose not to forgive, then we have set our heart against love. And that is why our Lord says, if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. As we pray in the Lord's Prayer, every time we pray in the Pater Noster. It's not because God is childish. He says, well, you're not going to forgive, so I'm not going to forgive. It's because your heart, due to the choice you make in not forgiving, has closed itself off to love. And if your heart is closed off to love, then your heart is closed off to God. It's not God being arbitrary. <laughs> it is part of the way our souls operate. It's the laws of the physics of our souls. Christian morality is nothing less than the art of discerning how to choose love as modeled by the heart of Christ. Anytime we choose against love, we are choosing to be less like Christ and more like the devil. Those are the only two options. Through the intercession of the sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, may our hearts be more like Christ every day for his greater glory and our salvation.